Um, Dr. Martin, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Thank you very much. I was, in fact, on mute. Thank there you. you go. <laughs> uh, has to happen at least once every semester. All right. So last time we were talking about the Heisenberg equation versus the Schrodinger, Schrodinger picture. Heisenberg picture versus the Schrodinger picture. OK, and so just to review what we had worked out or defined last time, the Heisenberg state is obtained by taking the unitary time translation operator, taking its dagger, and acting on the Schrodinger state. And so sometimes I might put a subscript on a Schrodinger state, but if I leave a, a subscript off, then you get to assume it's Schrodinger. OK, and so basically, because we're doing U dagger here, that means we're undoing the time evolution. And so this is actually just equal to the state at time t0, which of course is a constant, because we've just chosen some reference time to evaluate this. OK, so states in the Heisenberg picture just, don't, just never change by definition. And then to make things consistent, we have to also redefine operators. So the Heisenberg operator is gotten by U dagger Schrodinger picture operator U. That's true for any operator. Okay, and those, thing, those things have to go together to be consistent. And we found the solution to the time dependence of the operators is that if you take the time derivative of a Heisenberg operator, you get I over H bar times the commutator of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, which could be in some cases different from the Schrodinger picture Hamiltonian. if it depends on time explicitly, like if it has a cosine built, cosine omega t or something built into it. Uh, so we take the commutator there, and then we add in an extra part that only comes in if the operator itself, again, depends on time explicitly. So that's why I write a partial derivative there. A partial derivative means that I'm just asking for the time dependent that that's built into the definition of the operator. Like if the operator contains, again, like a cosine omega t or something explicitly within it. And then I convert that to the Heisenberg picture. OK, so let's do an example uh, of a very general type. OK, and so let's suppose our Hamiltonian looks like a typical Hamiltonian for a spinless particle in one dimension. There's nothing particularly special about one dimension here. This will work for three dimensions as well. But whatever our potential is here, we can assume that it can be written as a series of real numbers, real because we want this thing to be Hermitian, times x to the nth power. And so for the harmonic oscillator, we would only have V2. And for uh, a free particle, that thing would just vanish. OK, and so then it's true, because there's no explicit time dependence, that the Heisenberg Hamiltonian is the same Hamiltonian just written in terms of Heisenberg operators. OK, and so what does that last thing mean? Uh, it means that it's the sum over n v sub n Heisenberg x to the nth power, where these v sub n's are the same real numbers. OK, and so to prove this is like most proofs in quantum mechanics that are nice, just a one-liner or two-liner. 
if we take the Heisenberg P and we square it, then by definition, this is U dagger P U times U dagger P U. The U and the U dagger cancel to give you the identity operator. So this is U dagger P squared U. Okay, where, where P squared is shown in your picture. And same thing for any power of the Heisenberg position operator. I just write this out each, each X I write out as U dagger U, however many of them there are. Okay, and then each pair of U dagger U gives you the identity operator. And so the whole thing is U dagger X to the nth U. Okay, and so what that means is that if I assemble the Heisenberg Hamiltonian the way I wrote it, that is indeed U dagger H U the way it's supposed to be. Okay, so um, because this is here, what we're doing is we're using our general definition of what a Heisenberg operator is in terms of the Schrodinger picture operator. Okay, so the, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian doesn't change, but now let's look at the position and momentum operators. So also, if I take a derivative of a momentum, at zero, I'm taking the derivative of the explicit dependence of the Schrodinger picture momentum operator and the same thing for position. Okay, so if I go back up to this equation, that means at least for those two operators, I'm entitled to just forget about this last term. It doesn't contribute. Okay, so there's no explicit time dependence. But in the Heisenberg picture, they do depend on time. And in fact, that equation tells us that we wrote above tells us how they depend on time. So this is I over H bar commutator like that. And then we can evaluate this because the only part of the Hamiltonian that's coming in here is the p squared over 2m. So this is Heisenberg momentum squared commutator with position. That you can evaluate as minus 2, 2 because it's p squared, times i times h bar p sub h. And so that, when I work out the i's and the h bars, that is the Heisenberg momentum divided by M. Okay, and so then I can do the same thing with P. So this is the time dependence of the Heisenberg momentum from our equation up there, it looks like this. So we just have to work out that commutator now the only thing that matters out of the Hamiltonian is the, is the potential part because the momentum of course commutes with itself. Any operator commutes with itself. Okay, and so this I can write as I over H bar. I just break it down into the power series that we wrote above. Even if it's not a power series, this works. Okay, and then we evaluate this commutator. Now I get an I H bar and N because there are N of the X sub H's. Once I do a commutator with one of them, then the other ones are left alone. So I have, because there's nothing more to commute them with. And so here I get an N minus one. And so now if I take that power series and I reassemble it back into uh, uh, what I get is a, derivative of the original potential with respect to X. Okay, and so this comes out to minus 
derivative with respect to x sub h of the potential as a function of x sub h. That's just using the power series. And then the h bars cancel and the i squareds give minus one. So one thing we can notice is that what happened here is that this is nothing other than the fact that the derivative, the velocity, for example, is equal to the momentum divided by the mass. And this is telling us the time derivative of momentum, which is the force, is minus the derivative of the potential. So these are the classical equations of motion. Okay, so Heisenberg picture are the same as the classical equations of motion. That doesn't mean that they're that the theory behaves classically because there's more to it than just the equations of motion of the operator. You have to compute probabilities and things like that. Um, but, but we're getting the same classical equations of motion. So just as a reminder, we mentioned this last time, but uh, it was a little bit sneaky of me maybe to assume when I did these commutators to assume that the commutators are the same as in the Schrodinger picture, but it is true. So here we used the fact that if I take the commutator of X and P in the Heisenberg picture, so now both of those operators, we just showed they depend on time, but I can write them like this. In terms of Schrodinger picture operators. And then that's U dagger commutator of X with P. That we do know is I times H bar. And then once it's replaced by the number I times H bar, then this u dagger and that u can recombine into the identity operator. And so this is equal to i h bar. So even though in the Heisenberg picture, these operators depend on time in some way, their commutator is still just i h bar. Okay, and actually we, we proved on general grounds that that should happen last time, that commutators at equal times uh, don't depend on which picture you're talking about. Here, it's very crucial that these times are equal. If I chose this to be a different time than that, then it wouldn't be true anymore. Okay, so we can make a little chart of the different pictures and how they're related. Let me put in this column, Schrodinger picture, and in this column, Heisenberg picture. Okay, and so first of all, they're related by a unitary transformation. So you might remember from Physics 660, one thing we said about unitary transformations is they're really a change of basis. And when you have a change of basis, that just means you're changing your description of what's going on. You're not changing what's actually going on. And so that's one way of thinking about why they describe the same thing. So in the Schrodinger picture, states are time dependent. And in the Heisenberg picture, states are constant. In the Schrodinger picture, things like position and momentum are constant. And in the Heisenberg picture, they're not, they depend on time. In fact, that's sort of the whole time dependence in that version of the theory. But things that are the same in both pictures are things like matrix elements. That's good because matrix elements are things we actually use to make predictions and in particular expectation values are the same in both pictures. That's a special case of a matrix element. And so if we just take 
the expectation values of what we derived up here, then I don't need the subscript H anymore because they're guaranteed to be the same in both pictures. And so here I can write just time derivative of the expectation value of X is the expectation value of P divided by M and time derivative of the expectation value of P is minus the expectation value of the derivative of the potential, otherwise known as the force. Okay, so things don't, don't just uh, behave classically, but the expectation values behave classically. Okay, any questions on that before we move on to another picture? All right. So now we're gonna talk about the interaction picture, which for my money is much more useful than the Heisenberg picture. Okay, but for the interaction picture, we need something to be true first. We need to consider only Hamiltonians that have a particular form. So the Hamiltonian can depend on time. We're, we're always interested in time dependence when we're doing this stuff, but we're going to assume that it splits into two parts. One part's gonna be constant and hopefully simple, something that we can solve or we already have solved, and then the rest that has the rest of the time dependence. So I'm gonna call that W, W depends on time. And H zero is constant and hopefully simple or relatively simple. So the idea of the interaction picture is instead of transferring the time dependence of the whole thing from the states to the operators, which is hard to do because we don't know how to solve the whole thing, we're just gonna transfer the H zero part, the part that we understand of the time dependence Uh, from the states to the operators. Okay, so how does that work? I'm just going to do it as a definition. Okay, so here's my interaction picture state, which depends on time. And I'm gonna write it as e to the i h zero, t minus t zero over h bar, acting on my Schrodinger picture state. Okay, and then to compensate for that, I'm gonna define my operators in the interaction picture to be same operator, same exponential operator, times A in the Schrodinger picture, and then the inverse of that operator. But always with H zero, not H, not the full H. Okay, so again, I've done a unitary transformation because H zero is assumed to be Hermitian. So E to the minus I time, or E to the I times the Hermitian operator is always a unitary operator. So again, this is some change of basis. And for future reference, let's call this, let's give that a name so we don't have to write it every time. We're gonna call that U0. The zero is to remind us that it's built out of H0. Okay, and so for example, note that if I take my H0 in the Schrodinger picture, and I convert it to the interaction picture using that last equation, it's a special case of the last equation, then that equals H zero again. And the proof of this is really simple. It's just that H zero in the interaction picture, according to the definition we just made is U zero, H zero, U zero dagger, 
but the U0 is just made out of H zeros. So everything commutes with everything else. So I can write this as H0, U0, U0 dagger, just commuting things right past each other, just like they were numbers. That's the identity operator because this is a unitary operator. And so the whole thing gives me back H0. So the good thing about that is in the interaction picture, we never have to talk about the interaction version part, uh, H0 part of the Hamiltonian versus the Schrodinger picture. They're just the same thing. Okay, so they're the same thing, but unfortunately the interaction W is not equal to the Schrodinger W. And again, I, I could put a subscript S on W, but we're just using the convention that if I don't put a subscript, you get to assume it's Schrodinger. Okay, and that's gonna be important in a little bit. Uh, further notes here is, I'll put this in parentheses because it's not directly relevant to what we're about to do. Let's say I have a case where W is zero. Then you notice that the interaction and Heisenberg pictures are the same. Okay, and that's just because this U zero is exactly in that case equal to what we called U before. And so I just replace U zero by U everywhere and everything's the same. On the other hand, if H zero is zero, then the interaction and the Schrodinger pictures are the same. And so one way of thinking about the interaction picture is it's something sort of halfway between the Schrodinger and Heisenberg pictures in a way that will be will turn out to be useful. All right, so now we can do the various things that we did for the Heisenberg picture for the interaction picture. And so you can show And I'm not gonna do it because every step of this is literally exactly the same as what we did for the Heisenberg picture. That if I take the time derivative of the interaction picture operator A, that's I over H bar, H zero commutator with the interaction picture A, plus an extra term that only happens to come in if the Schrodinger picture A happens to have built-in time dependence. So then I take its built-in time dependence, take the derivative and convert to the interaction picture. So that looks exactly like the Heisenberg picture thing and it's because the derivation is exactly the same. And so this is how operators evolve in time. Okay, now the one big difference between the interaction picture and the Heisenberg picture is that states do change in time. They aren't just constant and we need to find out how. So to find out how states evolve in the interaction picture. So our strategy here is going to be to take the interaction picture state, convert it to the Schrodinger picture state temporarily, and then convert the result back. All right, so let's do that. I h bar time derivative of our interaction picture state. First step is to convert that back to the Schrodinger picture. So we do that by writing u0 dagger psi. That's just the definition. Okay, and that has two parts to it. There's the part from the product rule of taking derivatives where I take the derivative of u0 dagger.
And then I'm running out of room here, but then there's the part where I take the derivative of the state because the state does depend on time in the Schrodinger picture. Okay, and now the good thing is we can evaluate both of those derivatives. So the first one gives us I H bar and um, the derivative of U zero dagger with respect to time is just I over H bar H zero U zero dagger. Okay, that we know just from our definition here of what U zero is. We're just applying that. So it's that stuff multiplied by the state again. Oops. And then the second term here, we can just use Schrodinger's equation. So Schrodinger's equation says this is the whole Hamiltonian, which remember is H zero plus W acting on the state. Okay, so we can put that in. So plus I H bar minus I over H bar H zero plus W. Okay, and then we can put back um, the U zero should have gone on the other side, sorry. Let me erase this and put my U, sneak my U zero in there. Okay, and now this neatly cancels with that and leaves us with only U zero W in the Schrodinger picture times psi. Okay, so that's good so far, but what we really want to do is work within the interaction picture. And so to work within the interaction picture, now our job is to convert that back into the interaction picture. So to do it, let's write it like this, U zero, W, U zero dagger, U zero psi. So I have done nothing there because that's the identity operator. I've just put in the identity operator. And the reason for doing that is because now I get to recognize that that's the interaction W and this is the interaction state, interaction picture state. Okay, and so now we've successfully turned everything on the right-hand side of the equation into interaction picture. And so I can rewrite that and summarize it and put it in a nice box to indicate that it's important. So the time derivative of the interaction picture state is the interaction perturbation or the W part of the Hamiltonian times the interaction state back again. Okay, and so that equation is telling us how states evolve. In the interaction picture. Okay, and so now in principle, we know everything we need to know about the interaction picture. We know how states evolve. And back up here, we know how operators evolve in time. Okay, so uh, none of this would be very useful if we couldn't actually solve these equations. And so now let's try for a solution. And the way we're gonna try for a solution is inspired by what happened in the Heisenberg picture or sorry, in the Schrodinger picture. So we're gonna write our state at a general time as some operator, which I'm gonna call U sub I, T, T zero, T 
times the initial condition, the initial state. So built into this guess, well, to the extent that u sub i is going to be a unitary operator, and it will be, this is just saying that states evolve by a unitary uh, matrix. Okay, and so this part of it right here, this is our initial condition. If we're trying to solve a problem, hopefully we know the starting state. And so built into that fact is the fact that it has no time dependence. That's gonna be useful when we plug it into the boxed equation above. And this right here is defining what our UI operator is. Okay, and it's going to be a unitary operator. And so that's our guess. Now we plug it into the boxed equation and we see what happens. Okay, and when we plug it in, this part is just gonna be the same on both sides of the equation. There'll be a time derivative of this on the left side of the equation. And so all that we get is I h bar time derivative of our u sub i operator is equal to our interaction Hamiltonian times u i back again. Okay, so now we've translated our, our equation for the state into an equation for the operator. If we can solve this for u sub i, then we can plug that into um, our definition up here somewhere. Okay, um, where is it? Uh, it's right in front of me. Uh, we can plug it into this. Okay, and then we will know how the states evolve. All right, so now to solve that, let's do the following trick. Let's relabel time as t prime just temporarily, and then integrate both sides. The reason we're relabeling it is because we want our limits of in, one of our limits of integration to be the time. Okay, and so what do we get? We get i h bar integral dt prime. We're going to go from t zero to t. On the left side of the equation, we have the t prime derivative of u interaction t prime t zero. Okay, and then on the right side of the equation, we have the same sort of integral. Remembering to relabel our t's as t primes. Okay, and now the good thing is we can evaluate the left side of the equation because it's the integral of a total derivative which according to the fundamental theorem of the calculus is equal to u i t t zero minus u i t zero t zero. Okay, but u i t zero t zero is definitely the identity operator. Okay, and so putting all that together, we can solve, or not really solve, but let's write ui of t t zero is equal to identity operator minus i over h bar times an integral. Okay, so I nearly slipped up and called this a solution. It's not a solution yet because 
the thing I need to solve for the UI operator is actually on both sides of the equation. And not only is it on both sides of the equation, but on the right-hand side of the equation, it's mixed up with W inside this integral. And so I definitely can't claim to have solved for it yet. Um, this is known as an integral equation, as opposed to, for example, a differential equation. Okay, but now we can go ahead and solve this by iteration. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to assume that W is a small thing somehow. Okay, so if I assume W is small, then on the right, on the right hand side, these, this U is just the identity, so I can plug the identity operator in here. And then that will tell me U is approximately just this stuff without the identity operator. Then I take that and I plug it in again for this U. And then I'm going to get an identity operator plus another term involving W, so there will be two Ws. Then I take that and I plug it in again. And I just keep evaluating the left hand side in terms of the right hand side and plugging it in over and over again. That's what my iteration means. And so let's write out what you get when you do that. The first term is again, the identity operator. The second term is going to be this integral where in this term, I'm just gonna replace u by the identity. So I write nothing there. Okay, the third term is gonna be minus i over h bar squared. And now I need to do two integrals. So the second integral, I need to distinguish its, its variable of integration. So I'm gonna call that t double prime. And then I've got W of I of T prime, W of I of T double prime. Okay, and if I keep doing that, the nth term will look like this. I'm gonna have N integrals. I'm gonna call them now DT1, DT2, Notice dt2 integral only goes up to t1 because I'm plugging in t equals t1 in that term. And then let me just write dot, dot, dot here. The last integral is gonna be from t0 up to tn minus one. And it's gonna be an integral over dtn. And then what goes here is just the product of all my wi's. Now I have to be a little bit careful because the WIs don't necessarily commute. And so I have to make sure I write them in the right order uh, the way I've done there. That's the right order to write them in, correct order to write them in. Okay, so it's an infinite series, but now you can check that it actually is a solution by plugging into the boxed equation. That was a, our differential equation. Let's just go, slip, go up here and remind ourselves what it looked like. It involved a derivative with respect to t. And so when we plug that in, notice that the, the outside integration is always an integral with t as the upper limit of integration. And so when we do that, we'll always get rid of one integral and then the result will be the same as multiplying by i h bar times w. And so that's why this thing will work when you plug into this differential equation. Okay, so if, I, if you want, I didn't have to bother with the integral equation. I could have just said, let me write this down as the answer, 
plug it in, check that it works. Okay, so that's the great thing about the interaction picture is that just assuming that W sub i is not large, that if you assume it's small, then this series will have a chance of converging. Unfortunately, if W sub i is large, then the integral, then this, this uh, series might not converge and then you're in big trouble. But we're gonna assume it converges. And by the way, there's another even clever, this is called the Dyson series. It's one version of the Dyson series. There's also a Dyson series in the Schrodinger picture that looks similar, but is slightly different. Okay, and you can write it as the following compact expression, a time-ordered exponential of minus i over h bar integral t zero to t dt prime interaction w at t prime. Okay, so what does that compact expression mean? The t symbol means time ordered. It's an instruction that whenever you see anything to the right of it, that's evaluated at some time. And in this case, it's just the w sub i's. So a w sub i at time t sub j is supposed to be reordered to appear to the right of w i at t sub k whenever t sub j is less than t sub k. So there's some non-trivial combinatorics that goes into showing that that's the same thing as this up here. This time ordered thing is very tricky. And one of the things that's tricky about this is when you expand the exponential, there's a one over n factorial in the expansion of the exponential, but then you get lots of dis different contributions with different orderings. And then when you recombine them all, you find out that that neatly just gets rid of the one over n factorial. That's why there's no one over n factorial here, even though there is in this equation. So even though they might look a little bit different, they're in fact the same. Okay, so now we have a solution to the interaction picture time evolution. And now that the interaction picture has done its job, we're gonna, we're gonna wanna translate things back into the Schrodinger picture, which is our preferred way of doing things. So let's compare the Schrodinger and interaction pictures. What, let's compare what they say for the states or for the state of the system. Okay, so in the Schrodinger picture, we write this state. We know that we can write it like this. It's a unitary operator acting on the initial state. Okay, and now we translate everything into the interaction picture. This is u0, t minus t0, u interaction, u0 t minus t0 dagger. Okay, acting on the Schrodinger picture state at time t0. So I've just translated my u operator into the interaction picture. And now we're going to do completeness. And in fact, we're gonna use completeness twice in one equation. And we're gonna use completeness for the eigenstates that we're gonna call N of the part of the Hamiltonian that we can hopefully solve, namely H0. Remember the full H is time dependent, so it's not really worthwhile computing its eigenvalues, even if we could, which we usually can't. Okay, so all of this is equal to sum over M, sum over N. Those are our complete states that we're gonna sum over. Okay, I've just written the identity operator. Now I write U0, 
ui u0 dagger. I'm leaving off the time arguments just to make things a little nicer. Now I'm going to write the identity operator again, summing over n. That makes it the identity operator. Like so. Why did I use completeness? I used completeness because h0 here is, or sorry, u0 here is built out of h0. And now that it, these are eigenstates of h0, I can just evaluate what u0 is acting on them. Namely, these are just exponentials, not of operators anymore, but of their eigenvalues that you get by acting on the corresponding state to which they are adjacent. Okay, so I just get that instead of the h zeros. I just replace them by their eigenvalues. And then I write the rest of this. I'm going to put back the time dependence here. Okay, so we're trying to we're trying to solve for this state. <clears throat> Excuse me. And let's stare at this and, and think about what we've accomplished. So parts of this we're going to know because if somebody gives us a problem and tells us the initial state, then we know this thing because presumably we, we're, we're assuming we know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of H0, the simple part of the Hamiltonian. So we know that. We also know this because we know those eigenvalues. We know what the states M are. And so everything that we don't know is this right here. And so whenever you have something that you don't know what it is, or you don't immediately know what it is, a useful problem solving trick is to give it a name or define it to be something. So we're gonna define this to equal the transition amplitudes. That's just a name. And so let me write it out exactly what we're doing. We are defining the transition amplitude for n to go to m as a function of the time and the initial time to be the matrix element m interaction picture t t0 n. Okay, those are the, that's the definition of the trans of the transition amplitude. It's the one thing we know, need to know to evaluate how states change in time. And here's the good thing is we can evaluate this now. We can evaluate it using the Dyson series or some approximation to the Dyson series, assuming that the Dyson series actually converges. Okay, so Let's just see how that works. Given some initial coefficients, which I'm going to define like this, Cn of t0 is n psi of t0. That's this right here. Then what do we learn? we learn that the state at some arbitrary time is a sum over m cm of t psi, psi of t0 Oops. where we now can evaluate what those coefficients are. Cm of t is sum over n e to the minus i t minus t0 curly e n minus curly e m over h bar times the transition amplitudes times the initial coefficients. Okay, so the meaning of this is if you know the, the initial state, then you know the initial coefficients. 
if you know the Hamiltonian H0, then you know its eigenvalues. And so you know these phase factors. And now we know the transition amplitudes, or we can evaluate the transition amplitudes using this equation from the Dyson series. And so we are done, right? So now we know, now we know the coefficients of the initial that act on the initial state. Okay, and so then we know uh, everything there is to know. Okay, so next we're out of time today. So next time we will uh, evaluate this and then we will exploit this by defining time dependent perturbation theory uh, using exactly these equations. All right. So one more thing I wanted to mention is that there are corrections to the notes. I wanted to remind, I mentioned this in the past, but I wanted to remind you that the correction, there are corrections to the notes. I think we're up to nine or 10 of them now, uh, can be found on the course webpage. There's a link and it, it loads as a PDF file. And you don't have to download the PDF file all the time, but you might just check from time to time on the course webpage. And it'll tell you the date at which it was last updated. In this case, if you look, the date that it was last updated was March 7th, which was yesterday. And so there are, uh, again, there are about nine or 10 corrections to the notes uh, so far. All right, any questions on today's lecture? All right, then if not, we will continue or wrap up talking about the interaction picture uh, next time, and then we'll be off to do time-dependent perturbation theory. All right, see you on Wednesday. Thank you, have a good one. Thank you so much. Have a good one.